Welcome to Bench to Bedside, a weekly series of live conversations about recent advances in cancer, from the research bench to treatment at the patient's bedside. And now, your host and the director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center, Dr. Roy Jensen. Hello, I'm Dr. Roy Jensen, and joining me is Dr. Joel McGurk, director of the Hematologic Malignancies and Cellular Therapeutics Division at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. The FDA has approved a third CAR-T therapy in the fight against cancer. Our cancer center played a pivotal role in this approval. The University of Kansas Cancer Center is the only place in Kansas City and the state of Kansas that can provide CAR-T therapy. We are here to explain how patients can benefit from this therapy. Dr. McGurk, let's start with uh, defining uh, CAR-T therapy and how it works and uh, how effective it is compared to uh, other treatments. This technology is built off of our better understanding of the immune system. The immune system, as you know, should not allow us to develop cancers in the first place, but cancers are smart and they figure out how to ev evade the immune system. So this strategy of CAR-T cells takes patients' cells, specifically a type of immune cell T cells, out of their bloodstream to the laboratory and genetically re-engineers it to again recognize the cancer cell, expand those cells in the laboratory, and then send it back to the clinic and infuse it intravenously through a vein, through an IV, into the patient. Those cells sweep throughout the body, attach to cancer cells, punch holes in them, and then release sm small molecules called granzymes that go inside of the cell and tear its DNA apart, so highly personalized, uh, genetically engineered therapy using the immune system. So why is the uh, scientific community uh, so excited about this particular form of therapy? Uh, incredibly remarkable results have been realized in a couple of diseases so far. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia that's relapsed and no longer responding to chemotherapy in children and young adults has a survival numbered in weeks to several months, not years. Only uh, single digits will survive beyond a year in that setting. Mm. With CAR T cell therapy, in a very important publication this past fall, 85% of patients went into complete remission with CAR T cell therapy, whereby their expected complete remission would have been in the single digits. That's a stunning result. Wow. A similar result has been realized in the most common form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in adults, called diffuse large cell lymphoma, where again, a population of patients who have received chemotherapy and failed to respond or relapsed and no longer are responding to chemotherapy, 7% would be expected to respond to any subsequent chemotherapy and achieve a complete remission. With CAR T cell therapy, more than half of such patients have gone into complete remission, and the majority of those have had durable complete remissions now beyond a year, unlikely to relapse. That, too, is a stunning result. That's, that's incredible. So what is the latest uh, FDA uh, CAR-T therapy approval? The most recent approval has been uh, for a drug called Kimraya, which is produced by a, a manufacturing company, Novartis. This Kimraya is the second uh, edition, the first having been Yescarta uh, by a different corporation treating diffuse large cell lymphoma. Kimraya, this new, newest approval, was first approved in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, actually the first genetically engineered therapy approved in the history of our nation was this Kimraya for acute lymphoblastic leukemia in children and young adults. Th there are similarities be behind that type of acute lymphoblastic leukemia and diffuse large cell lymphoma in adults, so at the same time that that was being approved, studies were underway in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, diffuse large cell lymphoma, and that secured its approval in that setting as well. Great. So how is our uh, cancer center involved uh, in this FDA approval? We were the first center in the world in a multi-center, multinational trial of this drug, Kimraya, to enroll a patient, and we uh, have been the lead accruing site. We treated more patients than any other center in the world uh, on that study that led to the approval. We had patients coming to us, as you know, from other very prominent centers in the country and other nations. Uh, uh, patients came uh, to University of Kansas Hospital and Cancer Center for this therapy. 
So if you're just joining us, uh, we're talking about the recent FDA approval of Camaraya, the latest CAR T cell therapy to fight lymphoma. Our cancer center played a pivotal role in the clinical trials testing this new therapy. If you have a question about CAR T or clinical trials, we invite you to join the conversation now. Remember to share this link with people you think might benefit from our discussion. Use the hashtag bench to bedside. So Dr. McGurk, uh, CAR T um, therapy is considered personalized medicine. Why is there such a spotlight uh, on personalized medicine approaches and what does uh, scientific advancement in this space mean for our patients? As you know, Dr. Jensen, historically, over the last 40 or 50 years in cancer medicine, radiation therapy and chemotherapy drugs have been applied to a disease process, such as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, very broadly, and not specifically for an individual patient. Fortunately, as I mentioned, and as you know well, we've learned a great deal about the immune system, but we've also learned a great deal about how these individual cancer cells uh, behave, what makes them tick. And we've discovered through genomics, a better understanding of the genetics that make up these cancer cells, that there's a lot of specificity in individual patients and there are subgroups in all of these diagnoses. So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is a broad group of many mm -hmm. different diseases that behave uh, genetically in a very different way. And so personalized and precision medicine is directed at, under, uh, at, at that underlying biology that is unique to that perhaps individual patient and unique to their, the genetics of their disease and how their disease is behaving. And so, for example, with CAR T cell therapy, we're taking the patient's own immune cells, their own T cells out, and genetically re-engineering them, expanding them and re-infusing them into the patient, and they'll be accepted as self in that patient, not rejected by the patient's immune system, be able to attach to that cancer and do the, doing the killing. That's highly personalized medicine, and it's very precise. These cells are genetically engineered specifically to go after a, a molecule expressed on that patient's cancer. Hmm. So in, in May of 2018, there are three CAR T therapies uh, now commercially available uh, to patients. Could you review those three therapies uh, for us and discuss what types of cancer uh, these therapies apply towards? Yes, certainly. Kim Raya, uh, the one that has re received approval most recently for diffuse large cell lymphoma, was first approved for acute lymphoblastic leukemia in children, adolescents, and young adults, very specifically. We hope in the future to see expansion into older adults. That has not yet occurred, is not approved for that indication yet. The second therapy to be approved was Yascarta, and that was the first indication for diffuse large cell lymphoma, again, the most common form of non Hodgkin's lymphoma in adults. And this most recent addition, Kimraya, the approval this past week, is again for the same group of patients, diffuse large cell lymphoma. So how do you determine uh, which therapy uh, to use if there's overlapping uh, indications? And do tr patients have to be treated with chemotherapy first? Patients do receive chemotherapy first, but the chemotherapy has a different intent. The chemotherapy is not being directed in this setting at uh, the cancer itself but rather at suppressing the immune system of the patient with the large cell lymphoma, mm -hmm. that is an environment that is most conducive to the expansion, growth, uh, and viability of these engineered T cells. Mm -hmm. And so that's chemotherapy specifically to serve that purpose. There is great overlap, almost universal overlap, be between these two constructs, Yascarta and Kimraya. And so for the individual patient making decisions about which therapy they should receive, uh, can be somewhat challenging today, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Uh, in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, there is only one approved therapy, that's the Kimraya therapy, and so we have only one choice outside of the setting of a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. For most of these patients, as you know, we have many trials in our own cancer center. Uh, we uh, work hard to avail them of the newest uh, therapy in the context of a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. So. Why is our cancer center the only one in the metro in the state of Kansas allowed to offer CAR-T therapy? Well, um, uh, we're a National Cancer Institute designated uh, cancer center, so we, that has availed us of investigational studies that are available only to uh, a relatively small group of uh, centers uh, across the nation. In addition, uh, we've been able to leverage our uh, National Cancer Institute designation 
uh, to bring more resources to our institution. These are very resource uh, intensive studies uh, uh, when mm -hmm. we uh, enrolled patients on the studies I described earlier and in the clinical setting for approved constructs like this. It takes a large comprehensive team to make these therapies effective and safe for our patients. Nurses, laboratory personnel, a specialized pharmacists, uh, social workers, financial folks, these are very costly therapies. Um, uh, and uh, so a comprehensive team. Our center, as you know, has published a a, a very uh, important landmark article to give guidance to other centers around the nation about how to set up such a team. We call it our CAR Hub team, mm -hmm. uh, but a multidisciplinary group of people. Uh, and we've been invited to give national presentations about how to construct these teams. So again, a great deal of infrastructure and support uh, to be able to safely apply these therapies. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you mentioned the C word, uh, cost uh, yes. earlier. Uh, could you tell us, uh, does insurance uh, pay for CAR-T therapy and, and what, what is the approximate cost of these uh, treatments? The approximate cost of these treatments is in the $400,000 to $475,000 range, in that range. Very costly therapies. Um, however, there are uh, economists who look at these, th uh, these issues and are able to make determinations about what would it have cost had we not had this therapy. Life years saved, mm -hmm. uh, work productivity, um, and uh, what other therapies these patients might have received that even, uh, even if ineffective would have been very costly as well. But this is very costly therapy. And so an institution can only undertake such therapy either in the context of a clinical trial where all of the therapy is supported or in the commercial space such as for these three approved uh, indications, these three constructs that are, out, that are out there, one must have insurance support, and that must be secured before the patient can be treated. That having been said, the insurance, uh, um, the in, uh, in, insurers have been very supportive of this therapy. We've met with them on a national level, uh, explained to them these therapies, uh, uh, and uh, if we dot all our I's, cross our T's, and do a good job, and again, that takes a comprehensive team to make sure that that work mm -hmm. is done, presented to the insurance company, uh, we've not had uh, challenges uh, to appropriate cases in our center. Hmm. That's, that's great news. So we, we were talking uh, earlier before the program began that um, you know, these current constructs are, are probably not the final word on what CAR-T therapy is going to look like uh, going uh, in, into the future. Um, you know, it's, it's my belief that, um, you know, this therapy is probably going to remain uh, fairly expensive while we're kind of sorting out what are the appropriate constructs uh, to be utilized in a particular situation. But once that gets sorted, uh, then I suspect, just like any other um, approach, um, you know, the price will probably come down to something um, maybe a little more uh, manageable, but I, I don't know what your thoughts are. I completely uh, on agree. That. I, th I think it's essential that the, the uh, price comes down significantly. And uh, the reason for that uh, co comes back to your first question, uh, and that is where are we technologically? We have these constructs out there in the marketplace now for patients ready to use tomorrow in our patients, but where is the field? Uh, the field is, uh, uh, is racing ahead at breakneck pace. So uh, as we discussed, I recently came back from a CAR-T meeting in Boston this last week. Scientists from around the world presented at that conference. Uh, and we're really at the very, very tip of a, a large iceberg in the following way. These therapies will continue to be made to be more safe, more effective for our patients so that we don't have 50% complete response rates, but God willing, we'll have 100% complete response rates that are durable and more curative for our patients and safe for our patients. These therapies are not without potential toxicities. Mm -hmm. Cytokine release syndrome, one heck of a case of the flu, some patients have to go to the intensive care unit. Neurological toxicities, transient, but they can be quite serious and even life-threatening. So a great deal of work is being done in those spaces. In addition, so far, I've described to you targeting of blood cancers, acute right. lymphoblastic leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But a great deal of the work that was presented in Boston this last week was directed at solid tumors, breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer. Not to give false hope to folks, a lot of work needs to be done. 
to optimize these constructs, make them effective, and not cause more harm than good. A lot of work needs to be done, but that work is being done. And uh, some really extraordinary uh, studies uh, and research efforts were presented this last week, uh, I think giving great hope. So I, we're going to see this uh, uh, immunology field expand remarkably. It already has, as you w uh, know, uh, every bit as well as I do. We're going to see this continue to explosively grow. And therefore, if we're looking at much more common cancers than the blood cancers I've described, such as breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, the cost is going to have to come down for society to be able to support such therapy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the, uh, the key aspects that it, in terms of my understanding of CAR-T therapy and why it's so successful on blood cancers is because we have great targets. And um, so I've kind of analogized it to, um, you know, somebody wearing a, a neon orange uh, baseball hat in the dark. Uh, it's, it's a great target and you know exactly, you know, what to shoot at. Whereas for solid tumors, it's like all the cells are wearing a, a, a red baseball cap. That's and, right. But there's a difference between a Cardinals hat and a Nebraska Cornhusker hat and a Pittsburgh State hat. And those are the subtleties uh, in terms of the targets that, you know, that's one of the huge problems we have to solve for, for solid tumors. That's right on the mark. That's absolutely correct. Um, uh, but you know, uh, as a physician scientist, that uh, 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 your, uh, your type are smart and figure out ways to get around these cancer cells. And so we're putting our brains up against these cancer cells and, uh, and figuring out that they may have molecules that are expressed on other tissues, but some solid tumors, for example, will have uh, molecules that are never expressed in other tissues, except in, the, in their normal healthy mm -hmm. molecules, never expressed in the context of uh, other normal tissues, only in the cancer cell. And so you can make these CAR T cells only become active and kill if they see both of those molecules on the surface. Mm. Or molecules inside of the cell can actually be seen. They described it, one of the scientists in Boston this, this last week as x-ray vision, being able to see inside of the cell and what proteins are inside of the cell that are unique to that cancer cell perhaps. Because as you know, those, those molecules inside of the cell get broken to pieces and put up in the, on the surface of the cell in the context of a heavy machinery, major histocompatibility complex. And that allows a construct T cell receptor. So we've been talking about CAR T cells, mm -hmm. but there's another construct that's uh, 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 running uh, quickly in uh, the solid tumors called TCRs or T cell receptor modified constructs. They can see the proteins inside of the cell and attack proteins that hopefully will be unique to the cancer cell and not attack normal healthy tissues as well because that could be disastrous. Right. Yeah, that's, that's great. So, you know, for the last, well, since the 1960s, chemotherapy has been the backbone of, of many um, uh, therapeutic regimens uh, against cancer. Do you foresee a time when uh, we will be able to, you know, sort of put that era behind us and to have, you know, exclusive uh, immunologic approaches or cellular therapeutic uh, approaches? Do you think that that's even possible? I absolutely think that that's possible. I think it's an expectation of us. Uh, uh, men and women have saved innumerable lives over the last four or five decades now of chemotherapy and radiation and combinations and stem cell transplant, as you know. But we've lost a lot of battles during that pro those many years as well. And in the process, we've made people uh, terribly ill, often with good intent, of course. Uh, uh, so moving toward uh, a future where we have much more precise therapies that are targeted just at cancer cells and take out the cancer cells without causing serious collateral damage and do a great job of taking out the cancer cells. So increasing uh, cure rates, that absolutely is our future. That's where we're going. And we will have a future someday, not soon enough, where chemotherapy as we know it today and radiation therapy as we know it today will be something of the past and we'll have a, 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 a much more effective therapy for our patients, much safer. Um, it, it's an, this is the most, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the preacher here, but in my career, this is by far the most exciting time of my entire career, 30-year career as a cancer specialist. And I've always been excited about uh, cancer medicine and uh, trying to make a difference. But this is something very different. We're really in the midst of a revolution in cancer therapeutics right now. 
So uh, cytokine storm sounds uh, pretty serious, I, and I know that um, you know patients are really uh, deathly ill uh, during that. Is is there anything um, that we have that can predict uh, whether or not patients are going to have that? Or uh, you also talked about neurologic uh, complications. Uh, yes. So, so tell us about that. Really important question. Cytokine release syndrome, neurologic toxicity are the most common toxicities. They can be very serious. As I mentioned, some patients have to go to the intensive care unit, and some patients, very few, thank God, some patients have died from complications. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what drives the cytokine release syndrome and this neurologic toxicity? That story is unfolding in a really eloquent way in laboratories across the country. We have our own uh, uh, investigator-initiated trial to address uh, cytokine release syndrome uh, in our center and understanding how, how these T cells behave. So when we get a case of the flu, T cells react to the infected cell the, with the flu virus. What makes us feel so terrible and have high fevers and lying in bed feeling miserable for three days isn't the virus per se, but rather the T cells response and releasing these molecules called mm -hmm. cytokines that call in the other troops, the other cells to come in and help fight this battle and have some toxicities that they cause in the cancer cell. So they have some good effectiveness, but they can overshoot the mark and make people terribly sick. When the T cells and the CAR T cells are doing their thing to kill the cancer cell, they're releasing similar molecules, mm -hmm. but in higher concentrations than when we have a bad case of the flu. So the flu times five or times 10 is what I tell our patients can possibly happen. High fevers, chills, decreased blood pressure, perhaps have to go to the intensive care unit uh, or even uh, worse. What are those molecules? What are those specific cytokines and can we interfere with them without uh, thwarting the effects of the CAR T cells and killing the cancer cell? And the answer is yes. There's one in particular called interleukin-6. So an antibody that blocks interleukin-6 from causing its toxicity has been developed and significantly decreases cytokine release syndrome. A beautiful presentation by a young man, a young physician scientist given in Boston this last week, showed another molecule called GMCSF. In animal models, not been studied in humans yet, but uh, about to be taken into humans, uh, blocking this molecule called GMCSF with an antibody completely wiped out the cytokine release syndrome mm. and the neurologic toxicity oh, wow. without uh, blocking the effectiveness of the T cell and killing the target cancer cell. So that's going to be taken to a phase one clinical trial soon. So uh, yes, understanding how these cells are behaving, interfering with the bad parts without interfering with the killing cancer cell part is well underway. Wow. That, well, that's great news because the other question I was going to ask, and it sounds like uh, you basically just answered it, is, you know, it's very clear that the flu-like uh, uh, syndrome is, is mediated by cytokines, but what about the neurologic uh, toxicity? It sounds like perhaps that's mediated uh, by cytokines as well. It sounds like it. It was an important uh, and challenging question, uh, and still is, but it looks like that story is unfolding. Initially, the thought was, well, perhaps there's uh, some of the cancer cells are in the central nervous system and they're being destroyed. That's causing toxicity. That doesn't appear to be the case. The other question was, were the CAR T cells getting into the central nervous mm -hmm. system and causing trouble? They're there. They do get into the central nervous system. They can kill tumor cells there. But for uh, a number of reasons and experiments, that didn't appear to be the case. But when they started looking at these specific molecules, these cytokines, in particular this interleukin-6 and uh, GMCSF, that started telling the story of what was causing the neurologic toxicity. Once that story started un unfolding, physician scientists and scientists started targeting those molecules to see if they interfered with them, would it wipe out these toxicities? And indeed, at least in some cases, in some early studies, it appears to be the case. Well, that's super exciting. It is. Thank you, Dr. McGurk, and thank you visitors for joining us. Uh, we can learn more about CAR T cell treatment options at www.kucancercenter.org slash CAR T. That's slash CAR hyphen T. We invite you to return next week for another episode of Bench to Bedside. Thanks for watching.